Hi, my name is Barbara, and this is my office. I'm so glad to be coming to you today. And we're going to be sharing a lot from the Word of God and enlarging our faith, because there's so much that God wants to do for His church and through His church, through His people, the Bride of Christ. God has invested his whole self in us, and he has a plan for us that's more than just about us having a good life or getting along or even just being invested in our own spirituality, and that's it. God has a bigger plan than that, and you're in it. A lot of times when I start talking with people, they assume a lot of things about me. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself before we start diving into uh, some of the beautiful teachings of our faith. We want to be disciples. We want to be disciples for Christ. We want to be missionary disciples. We want to live up to a baptismal promise of prophet, priest, and king. So we're going to learn about that. But first of all, in sharing with you a little bit about myself, um, I was not raised in a Christian home. I did not go to church as a child. I didn't learn the word of God or the Bible as a child. In fact, I joke around that I was basically 10th generation heathen. We didn't go to church on Easter or Christmas. So we weren't even priesters. And as far as I knew, I had never stepped foot in a church that I could remember. Now, my earliest memories, in fact, my husband just last night was asking me what my earliest memories were. And my earliest memories go way back. And one of my earliest memories is of being whipped. I grew up getting whipped a lot. My dad had some anger issues at that time in his life. And we were the recipients of that anger. And I can just remember getting whipped and tossed in my bedroom really, really young. And I would look out the window and there would be someone literally in the sky that would comfort me. When I got a little older, I thought, well, I had an imaginary friend, but he was always there to comfort me. He was always there for me when I was crying, when I was weeping. When I was sobbing, when I was confused, when I was afraid of my parents, afraid of my house, afraid of being alone, afraid of going to the dinner table, um, that friend in the sky was there for me and he took care of me. When I was a little older, when I was 12, my mother left. She left me and my brothers and I got along the best I could. Much later, as a student, as a young person, I had a bunch of friends. We were partiers. We were a wreck. We were a mess. I was acting out. I was looking for love in all the wrong places, like all the songs say. I was just a mess in my life. And I was hanging around people that were a mess in their life, too. And something wonderful happened down the street from my school were some little old ladies that knew how to pray. And those little old ladies started praying for me and my friends. And one day my friends upped and went to church. And I knew these kids, these kids like to party. These kids were into everything. This was the late seventies, everything that was going on, they were in it. And um, my friends came home and they're talking about Jesus. And I thought, oh my gosh, what have they gotten into now? And they're just Jesus this and Jesus that. And I watched them to see you know, let's see how long you can keep this act going. But I saw people come to Christ and immediately their lives changed. Immediately their addictions were broken. Immediately they were transformed. And you would think that this would excite me. It actually frightened me. Then they had the nerve to tell me that they were praying for me. Well, I didn't want them praying for me. 
I didn't want what they had. I was very suspicious of them. They made me nervous. Uh, they weren't hanging out with me the same way we used to hang out. I, I did not have a great reaction to all of this. And one night I found myself very upset at my friends and I found myself going to meet my friends at this church that they kept inviting me to. Now there was something going on called the charismatic renewal. I didn't know what that was. Uh, up to that point, Jesus to me was a swear word. I didn't know how to go to church. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know how to be. I wasn't sure what they even really believed. But I went that night uh, to basically tell my friends that I was leaving, that I'd had enough. If you're going to choose this, sayonara. I'll see you later. And when I walked in that building, I remember being surprised because there were about 500 young people in there. They had their hands lifted in the, to the Lord. They were worshiping Jesus. They were singing. They were actually singing. I remember it was the, an old Methodist church and the floors were moving as these college students were swaying to the music. I ended up down at the front and before the night was over, I just went and stood up at the front. I wanted to run out the back of the building with everything that was in me, but I went and stood at the front instead. Something in me that was attracted, I was conflicted. Run or run out or run forward. And I ran forward and I stood there at the bottom of the altar and the man that was speaking, I don't even remember what he said. He had a microphone in his hand and he stopped it and looked at me and he goes, young lady, can I help you? And I said, just get it over with. Whatever you did to them, do to me. And then he ignored me and kept walking and talking to the crowd. And pretty soon there were hundreds of other young people up at the front with me. I prayed that night. I asked Christ into my life. I surrendered my life to Christ. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't know any theology. I didn't know any Bible verses. I did not know the catechism. I didn't know anything. But what I did know was that when I woke up the next day, the sky was bluer, the sun was sunnier, the grass was greener, and I was a brand new person. I had a joy I couldn't explain. I had an excitement bubbling up inside of me. I didn't know theology, but I knew Jesus was real. And I knew that he loved me. I knew that I wasn't an accident. I knew that I'd been born on purpose. And I also thought about that man that I would see up in the sky. You remember that? And I realized it had to be Jesus. But why was he there? I Overnight, my life changed. Overnight, I just wanted everybody to know. I did not know that other people knew about Jesus. I did not know that other people knew that their lives could be transformed because here I was and nobody had ever told me. So I didn't know anybody else knew. So I was so excited. I became that person. I wanted everybody to know. I started telling everybody about Jesus. I'd go through the phone book. I'd go through my list of friends. I'd be out on you know, the street corner after church, witnessing, telling people about Jesus, down at the beach, singing, singing praise songs to the Lord, witnessing to, to uh, people that were walking on the beach, saw people give their lives to Christ. It was a really special time. Well, you know, God did such a work in my life and I was hungry. This was so good. And if it was true, then everybody needed to know. So I made up my mind. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I was ruined for any other kind of life. And to make a long story short, I decided to become a missionary, a Protestant evangelical missionary 
to tell the world about Jesus Christ. I've seen people get delivered, get set free from longstanding bondages. I've seen people on the brink of suicide have their lives and hearts transformed by the love of God. I've seen people that were inexplicably, they were in the middle of beginning the steps to end their lives. And in the middle of it, there'd be a knock on the door or their phone would ring or something would happen to stop them. And then somebody would tell them about Christ and they realized that God had sent someone to them just in the nick of time. I saw people come off of drugs. I saw people that were very promiscuous overnight turn into brand new people. I saw people come down off drugs with no side effects because nothing is impossible with our God. I saw people get emotional healing for things that had happened to them that had traumatized them. I started getting healing for things that had hurt me and traumatized me. Well, while I was training to be a missionary, I was going to go to third world nations and I was going to tell the world about Jesus Christ. So I'm preparing myself. And I remember very clearly one of the things I did was I took a course on how to win a Catholic or how to lead Catholics to Christ. I know it sounds crazy, right? But that's what I did. And I took that course and I, and I actually got a certificate for it. Now, in that course, I learned a lot of things from people that I think meant well, but maybe they didn't know themselves. So I'm equipped with my certificate. I'm equipped with Bible school. I'm equipped with missions training. And off we went for, to a life of giving ourselves around the world, anywhere that they would have us, where we can share the good news of Jesus Christ. We would do good works of mercy. We'd help out at orphanages and hospitals and clinics. We'd help feed people. We'd help, dig, we'd help uh, finance wells for villages that didn't have water. And we would preach the good news of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the eternal soul that needs to be healed. And we would see God heal people. We would see people get transformed. I remember being in India with my backpack and I'm just waiting for the rest of the team with another lady. And while we're waiting, somebody came and offered us some coconut water and I'm drinking my coconut water. And they just, they knew that we were the people praying for people and they just, you know, we're kind of acting out, you know, us praying for them, you know, touching them and touching their bodies where it hurt. And we started praying for people and we started teaching because now people that, you know, children were coming and young people were coming and the moms and dads were coming. And by the time our team came to pick us up, we had a crowd of, of about 150 people just standing out underneath the tree praying for people because God was moving and he was touching people's lives. One of the things that I discovered on the mission field was, you know, like most things, the actuality was a little bit different than my training. And I found out that there were a lot of Catholics out there that really, they, they really loved Jesus. They didn't need me to convert them. They, they were already walking with Jesus. And I remember this did not compute with me. I, this didn't make sense to me because I had a certificate and what I was witnessing was not making sense. One time in the Philippines, we were in a meeting and somebody came and said, we needed help with the meeting. We were gonna continue the meeting. So many people were coming to the meetings that we were approached. Well, do you wanna continue the meetings? We're going to, we're just going to keep going for free. We're going to have it on TV. You, you know, you just keep the meetings going. You keep praying for people. You keep preaching the gospel and we're going to make sure you're on the air. We're going to make sure you're in the stadium. And we said, sure. 
but there was a problem. A lot of our team was leaving to go back to the States and we needed help. So we put the word out. And I remember this lady came to me and she said, can we help you? And, we're, and I said, well, we need everybody's help. And later that night before the big meeting, when they, people were coming to get directions for how to help with this big crusade, and this lady comes up and she's got a bunch of priests and nuns with her. And I'm like, I <laughs> didn't know what to say. And so we put them to work and they participated. And I remember thinking, I don't understand this. I can't figure this out because I had that certificate. A lot of different things happen. One story that sticks out in particular over the years, we were ministering in a lot of different places, including the United States. And we had a mission base in rural Virginia. It was our mission base. Our, it's where my missionary cottage was that I lived in when we were at our mission base. And we had a visitor. We had a lot of visitors, actually. And we had a visitor that had come from Ireland. He was a priest. And I was asked by the director of our ministry, will you take this priest to St. Anne's in Ashland? Because he's going to be sharing there on Sunday. And I thought, wow, I was kind of wanting to talk to this guy anyway, and figure out what's he doing here. And so I said, sure. And I gave him a ride to Saint, old St. Anne's in Ashland. And I remember when I walked into that building, I looked all around and there were scriptures all over the walls, scriptures in the, in the stained glass. This was an old, uh, beautiful jewel of a church, just gorgeous, very old. And um, I just remember being stunned because there were scriptures everywhere. And then when my friend got up to begin sharing and the mass started, and it was the first time that I knew of that I had been in mass, I was floored because it was all scripture, the same scriptures that I had been reading in my Bible. And I thought, wow, I don't understand this. Um, I thought Catholics didn't read the Bible. And here was all scripture. And I was floored because I had that certificate. And I thought I knew what the Catholic Church believed. But I began to realize I didn't know. I had a friend that had come to visit our ministry. And they were volunteers. They were Catholics. And I thought, what are they, what are they doing here at our ministry? <laughs> and one day, Bill came up to me. I had been teaching in the morning service at our mission headquarters. And he handed me a book. He said, can I lend this to you? Will you read it if I lend this to you? And I wanted to be polite to this sweet couple. And I said, sure, I I'll take a look at it. He was so insistent. And I took it home. By this time, I was married. I had four kids, all of them miracles, by the way. And we're in the middle of our summer camp meeting. I have been teaching that morning. I'm volunteering in the office. I didn't have time to read his book. I was being polite. And so I put that book down in my missionary cottage and later, Bill came up to me. He said, are you done with my book yet? And I said, I'll get that to you tomorrow. And I went home that day and I felt bad in my heart. I thought, you know, Lord, I didn't even open that book. I should at least take a look at it before I give it back to him. And so I began to just go through the first pages and read a little bit. And it was, wow. That's really good. And I read a little bit more. Wow, that's really good. And I read a little bit more. Wow, this is really great. I read this whole book all through the night because I knew I had to give it back to my friend the next day. And I went up to my friend and I handed him this book to give him his book back. And I said, you got any more of these books? 
I had been reading what I later found out was one of the doctors of the Catholic Church. I didn't even know what that mean, meant. I didn't know what it meant. What does that mean? The doctors of the church. I had never heard of this person. And we thought we were cutting edge. We were a uh, prophetic evangelical ministry, worshiping Jesus, worshiping God, soaked in the scriptures, soaked in fasting and prayer, cutting edge ministry, sending people uh, to give uh, the glory to God through works of mercy and through the preaching of the gospel and through seeing people set free for the glory of God. And I, when I read that book, I was amazed because that book was talking about a lot of the things we were talking about. But I had a problem because that book was written 500 years ago by a woman who was a nun. And her name was Teresa of Avila, Saint Teresa of Avila. I had never heard of her. But now I was devouring anything I could get a hold of about Saint Teresa of Avila. Bill starts giving me a few other books. Then I got online and looked up the rest of this series about some of these early church fathers and mothers. And I began to order them for myself. I would circle what I didn't understand. I'd underline what didn't make sense to me. I loved what I understood. And then the parts that I had theological issues with, I thought, well, I'll they just didn't know. They just didn't know that. And um, I made my way through the doctors of the church. Well, my late husband and I ended up moving to the Midwest. We pioneered ministries. We pioneered churches. Uh, I had a ministry training where we would train people to do short-term missions in other countries. We took people to other countries to do mission work on their vacations. Uh, it was wonderful. We had a tent that we took to different Indian reservations all through the Midwest. We were preaching in churches as doing conferences, retreats, preaching all over the world. On top of this, and I had four children, and I'm reading this, these books about these Catholics during my spare time. And because we ended up in the Midwest, we were no longer with the Wolners. They had gone on to be lay missionaries in Cyprus, the island nation of Cyprus in the Mediterranean, where they still are to this day. And I was curious. I was loving what I was reading. I started visiting Catholic churches and just sitting in the back of cathedrals and basilicas when I'd be traveling. There was just something there that was drawing me that I loved, but I didn't know what it was. In the meantime, we're seeing God heal people. We're seeing people's lives being transformed when they come to the saving knowledge of Christ. But I'm reading these early church fathers and these people I'd never heard of before. Because when you're a Protestant, you basically think that once Jesus released the Holy Spirit, once the Father poured out the Holy Spirit, nothing much happened until Luther. You know? So in that whole gap, even though I had studied, this was all news to me. And I was devouring it. And I found it scriptural and it was beautiful. Well, I had all these questions. Why do they believe in the magisterium? What is transubstantiation? And why do they believe in that? Why do they confess to a priest? Why do they call priest fathers? I had so many questions. I didn't know who to ask. So what do you do in our day and age when you don't know the answers? You Google. So I started Googling for answers and I stumbled upon something called the Coming Home Network. Now, some of you have heard of that. And when I got to the Coming, the Coming Home Network, I, at that time, I was able to, um, you know, have a, uh, a, a handle of a pen name and be able to argue with the house theologians anonymously. 
Um, and it was really good for me. And then they contacted me and they said, are you interested in some literature? Well, I am a book lover. I love to read. And so they called me or emailed me and said, would you be interested in some books? I'm like, send me some books. Yeah. So I get a book. I get a box full of books. Well, now we're ministering. We have the church. We're missionaries. We're traveling around the world and pastoring the church and taking people to the nations and teaching people how to pray for other people. I, I am the pastor by day and I'm reading Catholic contraband at night. And this only raised more questions for me. But I began to read some wonderful, uh, uh, Howard was one of the people I read, uh, wonderful books by him. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. Uh, some Peter Creek, many, many other books. And that was explaining the Catholic position on some things. And I was like, floored. I'm like, why didn't anybody tell me this? Why didn't anybody tell me what Catholics actually believed? And so I was hearing it from Catholics instead of other people explaining to me who didn't know themselves. And it just amazed me. I had to really think about things. I had to really chew on it. I had to look into the scriptures. I had to look at my own heart and the Lord just kept drawing me. So my late husband died suddenly and I ended up moving to the Twin Cities. Now, while I was in the Twin Cities, God was healing my heart after the trauma of a sudden loss of a husband, the parent, the father to my children. There'd been difficulties leading up to that. But his, his, his death was just so sudden. And, you know, it took a while to recover from that. And God just ministered. He was so merciful and he was so good. And during that time of my recovery, the Lord put me on a sabbatical and I went to go visit my mom. Remember my mom that I mentioned earlier in my story, the one that left? Well, when God, when I came to the Lord, God did such a healing in my life that I was able to forgive my mom, that I was able to be a friend with my mom. And so when I started my sabbatical, my mom called me and told me she'd been diagnosed with fourth stage non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And because I was on my sabbatical, I had canceled 13 months of meetings I was able to go and be with my mom while she was being treated back in Washington state. So I'm with my mom in Washington. I've got my stash of books with me and every moment that I can, I'm reading these books. And I can remember sitting there with my mom one day. She was curious. She's like, what are you reading? I was like, ah. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell my mom that her crazy Pentecostal daughter is now reading the doctors of the church in Catholic theology. <laughs> so, I was like, "Oh, nothing, mom. Oh, nothing. You don't want to know." And she was like, "No, tell me. What are you reading?" And finally one day, we'd been praying for my mom. We'd been laying hands on her. People around the world were praying for my mom. We were watching I Love Lucy reruns to keep her laughing, to keep the healing endorphins going through her body. And one day she's sitting there and she was a little low and she was afraid. And she asked me again, what are you reading? And I said, mom, okay, it's Catholic if you really want to know. And I started to share with my mom. I said, I don't know what it is. I said, there's something that has drawn me and there's something there and I just feel this tugging and it doesn't make sense for where I come from, for the church I'm in, for me to be having these, these thoughts and to be so drawn to the church like this. And I'm telling my mom this and I said, I'm sitting in the back of cathedrals, there's something there, mom, I don't know what it is, but there's something there that really speaks to me. And my mother looked up at me and she said, well, you know, you were baptized Catholic. 
what? <laughs> no, you neglected to tell me that little part. I had no idea that I'd been baptized Catholic. So she starts to tell me about it. And right away, I call the church that where I had been baptized as a child, St. Francis Xavier in St. Louis, Missouri, I get a hold of somebody in the office and I asked for my baptismal certificate. And now instead of that old certificate, I had a new certificate. The thing that was amazing about this for me is I knew Jesus had been with me for, as a child, but I didn't know why. When I came and entered into salvation as a student, as a young person, I knew Jesus had been walking with me, but I didn't know why. And when I realized I'd been baptized, even though I didn't know I'd been in covenant with God, God never forgot that he was in covenant with me. I was floored. I was amazed. Now I understood why Jesus was with me when I was a child, when I was hurting, when I was alone, when I needed a friend that Christ was with me, even though I didn't know he was with me, he was still with me. Because of that baptism, I'd been given to Christ. That's grace. This brought up a lot of other questions, by the way. I had so many questions. When I went home, and by the way, I just want to add I was with my mom for her final PET scan and they scan, gave her that final PET scan that year and she was 100% cancer free for the glory of God. Can I get an amen? Woohoo! Thank you, Jesus. And that, my friends, was in 2010. She has been cancer free ever since. She's had checkups and everything since then, all for the glory of God. Amen.